So hello everyone and welcome to session three of Tarot on 2020. Welcome indeed to Radio Armageddon, the voice from the end of the apocalypse as we enter into um, the third um, session that we're holding during the um, corona pandemic of 2020. There are a lot of things happening live as we speak and um, uh, I thought it would be interesting to uh, have discussions, open uh, forum and um, do a bit of tarot teaching, divination teaching in this most um, uh, uncertain and troubled of times. So welcome to those joining us live um, and to those who are joining us as a recording, um, thank you. You can still make comments um, when you watch this as a recording as well. I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, Sabian symbols today and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we will be having a bedtime story uh, continuing from uh, Wake World by Alistair Crowley uh, which is included in Conks on Pax. This is not, um, as yet anyway, a source of free readings. I'm not going to do free readings, just demonstrations and tarot teaching. Um, if you want me to draw a card, then I've drawn this one for you. And it is the moon. This is a dog and that's a wolf. You can tell that because that one says wolf and that one says howl. That's the moon up there. These are clouds, um, not wiggly bird, like flying birds. Um, that a four-year-old would draw. This is um, drawn by a 55-year-old, if you could believe it. So um, we are going to be talking about Sabian symbols, which is not my area of expertise, but I'm going to point you the right direction um, to the um, esteemed author and expert of Sabian symbols, um, um, a great um, a friend and mentor of mine in the sense of being an inspiration um, because he's someone who really does live what he teaches and what he does which is astrology and um, his name is Lindbergh Beck and we'll be covering the Sabian symbols through his book The Astrological Oracle um, which this was the original publication of it uh, quite a while ago and this is the epic new version of it that is self-published and contains the same information about the Sabian symbols. It's a huge, huge piece of material, um, so I'll, I'll tell you all about that in a bit. Now, um, hello Christopher, hello Anna, hello Debbie, hello Derek. Um, I've taken uh, Derek's advice as well. Um, to answer a question about cleansing your decks, but I'm not quite going to do it perhaps the way that uh, one might expect. I'm just going to do it um, uh, for real. So, um, um, hello Denny, um, and we will be covering astrology, um, uh, sorry, uh, Kabbalah and alchemy um, in uh, a later one. I noticed that Trump today had said that this event may go into July, August, which is where my cards from the um, pandemic prophecy seem to have landed um, this event. So we are in this for the long term. So you might be stuck with me every single evening for, for quite a while. So we're going to have to pace ourselves out just a little bit. And if we complete conks on packs, then I have a whole load of favourite bedtime stories to read to you, um, probably from Umberto Eco or um, uh, Borges. Uh, to my favourite short story authors. My teacher used to read those to uh, me and the group that I was in a long time ago and I have very fond memories of listening to um, those stories read out. And if you have any questions just ask them in the, um, in the comment section, um, whichever side it is, um, on your screen and um, I'll be quite happy to answer them if I can or answer them in the following video. So we have a nice number of people, 21, that's a nice um, group of people to have around the campfire, um, although it, it's just it's just dropped by two, so um, um, uh, we'll, we'll see how that fluctuates during this session. It should, we should be about uh, 40 minutes at most, um, these events aren't lasting um, much uh, shorter or much longer than that. Hello from Ontario, I gather that um, Canada's just made some uh, changes in its um, 
uh, response to the coronavirus um, pandemic as well. So um, today has been quite a day of um, big changes, big news from France, from the UK. I just watched the press conference in the States and I know that um, similar um, uh, restrictions and so forth have been announced in Canada as well. So um, let's just start with a practical issue about cleaning decks. Now, I am not the person to ask about uh, medical or clinical cleaning of decks in response to a pandemic. Um, and good morning in Australia and um, good morning, um, sorry, good afternoon to NYC as well. So, um, but I do know a little bit about, I live in the Lake District, it's very damp here, it's in England, which is very damp and grey anyway. So I do know a little bit about cleaning books that have got damp and decks as well. And so here is a very practical um, uh, solution and one I'm actually doing at the moment. Um, I've transported a number of decks um, and books from um, a damp storage place and I'm drying them out as we speak. And so here are the tools if you have damp um, decks or books as part of your cleaning. Regime. The first one is white vinegar, pure white vinegar. Um, it evaporates quite quickly, but it does leave um, a slight smell, but we deal with that in the second stage of our cleaning process. It's very useful for um, um, books, uh, book covers, um, if they're laminated or treated in some way where they won't soak up the white vinegar. So if this book was damp, it's nice and shiny, so I can spray it with the white vinegar and wipe it, and that helps um, the um, is it acid or alkaline with vinegar, um, but that helps kill any mold um, viruses actually on the. Um, sorry, I don't know if mold is a virus. It, see, I'm I'm not the expert in this. I just know what works. So. Um, if you have uh, mold on books, on covers and stuff, then white vinegar is the way to go um, with that. And then what I use is um, bicarbonate of soda. You can see I've already used some of this. It's very cheap. You can pick it up um, from your baking collection aisle in the shops, unless there's been a run on those, as there have been toilet rolls of late. So bicarbonate of soda, and what I do with that is I have a storage container, plastic in this case, and you put the books or decks inside that and you fill it full of bicarbonate of soda as much as you can. And uh, you can place it between the sheets as well. I've done that with um, the files with lots of paper. Um, I put the bicarbonate of soda in between each sheet and then you put this in the freezer because the freezer helps kill any um, sort of mold uh, spores. That's the word I'm after, spores on um, um, in it as well. It sort of um, uh, puts them into hibernation a little bit. You can never really get rid of damp entirely, um, but you can um, do a good treatment with this. And then what you do is uh, leave that for five days. Um, I usually leave it two weeks just to be sure. And incidentally, we're going to come back to Charles Williams in a few days um, uh, and his book, The Greater Trumps. So Charles Williams is an author that we will return to shortly. So um, you do that. And then what you need is the secret magician's weapon of a brush. And then you just brush the um, um, bicarbonate of soda, um, which is like a salt, um, off the... Um, books off the deck and um, that's it that's what you do and it helps take the um, um, aroma of um, uh, the aroma of uh, damp out of the books um, sometimes it can help if it's been um, fr from a smoker's home or something like that where it smells slightly of tobacco and so on um, if you don't like that smell, then bicarbonate soda will help remove that. Um, the other trick is to use um, 
the paper that you can put in dry cleaners or tumble dryers called laundry paper. My advice to you is don't use the perfumed version of that unless you want your ancient occult books to smell of um, springtime fairy fa fragrance, um, which a couple of my books accidentally now do because um, I didn't um, um, uh, understand that that fragrance is very, very strong. So um, I then had to put those books back in bicarbonate of soda in order to take the um, um, fragrance from the laundry sheets out. But if you get unfragrant, unfragrant laundry sheets, uh, you can put those in between the pages of a pamphlet, a book, a deck, and that really does help um, take the um, aroma out of the deck or book. And those are my tips for cleaning, and um, I've, I've used those a lot over the last um, few months in order to clean a whole batch of books and decks um, that got damp. So, um, what else are we going to look at? We're going to look at um, Sabian symbols. And um, for those who were watching the dream interpretation yesterday in session two, then I'm just going to briefly add another tip into our dream interpretation as we go along. Um, yeah, um, it's okay, Debbie Freeman, to love fairies in your tarot, but you don't want the um, essence of fairy fragrance in your dark grimoire of Armadale, um, because I don't think Armadale actually likes that um, uh, uh, higher level fragrance. So, um, I just if I may, I will be self-indulgent and answer Christopher's question. Um, perhaps we can share as well what got us into tarot. Um, for me, um, I was very young when I got into tarot. I tell this story in either Tarosophy or The Magister. Um, I was very lucky to have very um, um, new age minded parents and uh, I got into tarot, well, I got into occultism first um, when I was about 12 and um, I went to an occult shop when I was about 16, but before that, when I was about 13, I made my own tarot date, which I still have um, to this day, um, by going into the library in Belper in Derbyshire and I asked to go into the adults section of the library, uh, the grown-up section, because I only had a children's ticket, and I was allowed to loan uh, Stuart Kaplan's book called The Tarot. And inside it had a fold-out page with the IJJ, or 1JJ as they're sometimes called, uh, Swiss Major Arcana, and my dad had a photocopy machine, one of these brand new photocopy machines that had just come in um, in his workplace. So I pestered him and he photocopied those two pages of the book. Um, I did get to tell Stuart Kaplan in New York in person this story and he forgave me. Um, um, what, 35 years later for my breach of copyright. Um, so I photo, I got my dad to photocopy them. I then cut them out on bits of paper and I sellotape them to bits of cardboard that I cut out to the same shape. So I had 22 um, uh, cards um, that I then put in a coffee ground bag. Um, the irony of doing that uh, wouldn't uh, be apparent for about 30 years but um, and I then took them to school with me the following day. Now I only had read in the Kaplan book a brief description of the Celtic cross and I only had the majors and so what I did was I did Celtic cross readings with the majors only from the IJJ deck with reversals as well um, and I read like that for about two or three years before I was old enough when I was 16 to go into an occult shop called the Ace of Wands in Derby that no longer exists. And um, I um, bought a Aquarian deck um, that I think was first published in, in the early 80s, I think. 
um, and a, a Waitsmith deck, which again, um, this is the actual Waitsmith deck that I bought at that time and still have to this day, about 40 years later. So um, I think uh, Sterick is saying Man, Myth and Magic was a magazine series at the time. Um, for me, I was very influenced by staying up late and watching um, Tales of the Unexpected, a TV show um, with rather risque um, content. Um, but it started off with a carousel and um, evocative music and a lady dancing in the silhouette, which was very fascinating to a 13-year-old boy, um, with tarot cards around it. So somehow I think all of those things got conflated in my head and that's what got me into tarot um, and the esoteric. Um, at the time in England there were News of the World magazine articles on sex cult covens um, frolicking about in the woods and things and um, so I immediately applied to um, join a coven through a uh, contact service in my younger brother's music magazine uh, which was called the Golden Wheel. You uh, wrote, this is long before the internet, you wrote um, to a box number with your details and other people contacted you and then if you liked what they said you could then contact them directly and become um, pen pals. So um, I contacted um, occultists, satanists, black magicians, witches, warlocks, what, what have you, um, and I was still only about 15, 16 at that time, and maybe going on 17, and that's really how I started, and I got into contact with people through that, and then started working with esoteric things um, from that point. So uh, the tarot for me, I guess, has always been a language of spiritual development of magical purpose and intent and a language of the highest mysticism uh, which is why we're reading from Mr Crowley and um, why I like um, the Weight Trinic deck so much as well, the Weight Trinic images um, because those were Weight's uh, more spiritual images as opposed to the rather cartoon version he did as a what he called a delightful experiment with Pamela Coleman Smith. When they designed this deck, um, Waite was still holding to his oaths in the Golden Dawn Order. Pamela Coleman Smith had likely been given some instructions she wasn't supposed to have at her lower grade and so she did a brilliant job of designing the cards to those instructions but as a result these can be somewhat obscured or enigmatic as to their purpose and you know if you read um, uh, Pictorial Key to the Tarot you get the feeling that Waite wants to tell you a lot more but he's been very pretentious that he can't but it was just generally um, he did want to say a lot more, but he knew he couldn't because both his oaths and the fact that um, some of these teachings are um, graduated, so it's better to have one teaching first before the next one so that you appreciate the teachings as you go through these um, grades of mystical and spiritual ascent. Okay, so um, that's enough about that. Um, if you'd like to share your own background and why you got into tarot, how you got into tarot in this thread, then please do so when we close off the um, uh, live video. I'd be very interested to hear everyone's stories as much as you want to share in our uh, public forum. So I'd like to talk briefly about ooh, the Astrological Oracle in its two versions. Um, this oracle I actually call my secret weapon because um, it was um, produced by Elsie Wheeler and um, Mark Edmund Jones. Um, um, when was it? It was around the turn of the century, I think. Um, but basically, Mark Edmund Jones, um, an astrologer, um, was in touch with Elsie Wheeler. Elsie Wheeler was a sort of medium psychic spiritualist, um, clairvoyant, 
and what he did was he um, took her out to a park and um, produced um, for himself a set of uh, or a list of, of cards that were for each of the decans in astrology. A decan, for example, um, would be, um, for example, Virgo, um, 15 degrees, Virgo, 16 degrees. It's basically the signs of the zodiac divided each into 10, so you end up with, um, I think it's 360 of them around the circle. So for each sign, there is a Sabian symbol, so we have um, uh, 30, um, 10, each of which is 10 degrees of the sign of Capricorn, and 30 for Aquarius, and um, you know, 30 for Pisces, um, and Aries, and so on. So he basically held them and thought about them, and then Elsie Wheeler came up through her imagining, through her connection, through her, um, I think, connection to the uh, Brotherhood of Melchizedek, I think is mentioned, um, a symbol. And Mark um, Edmund Jones was um, delighted and surprised to see that these symbols often matched what he would say would be suitable for that degree and um, that sign. Now, the symbols themselves are beautiful because they are very time bound to their time. So, for example, opening up at random, we have an empty hammock or two prim spinsters. Two prim spinsters. And what um, the genius of um, Mr. Birkbeck, Lynn Birkbeck, um, has been to do is provide a wonderful boilerplate title for the symbols themselves so that we can apply them in an oracular way. So for example, Gemini 26 degree is winter frost in the woods. That's the, what Elsie Wheeler came up with. And Lynn, through his astrological background, has reinterpreted or um, yeah, reinterpreted in, in the proper sense of, of it as dormant power. So we can see winter frost in the woods, dormant power. And then in this particular book, he's then provided a general interpretation, a love interpretation, a money work creativity, and a karma attitude and health interpretation. And that's basically the bulk of the book. So an orangutan for uh, Virgo um, 16 degrees, an ornamental handkerchief for Virgo 15. An ornamental handkerchief is finesse, uh, fineness and finesse is the boilerplate. But then Lynn shows you how to actually interpret that in terms of each of the symbols. Now why this is um, a genius piece of work and what I call my secret weapon because I use the oracle, this oracle a lot, um, just as much as I use tarot, is for two reasons. Um, one is that Lynn ha has um, a lifetime of experience and um, we can see here using an oracle. Consulting the oracle using a nautical analogy. And then more importantly, I think, understanding the answer. Lynn's writing on understanding an oracular answer and how accurate an oracle actually is, is a real piece of genius work, useful for everyone who does divination. I can't recommend it enough. This little section at the beginning of the book um, is a gold mine for anyone who um, does readings for themselves or does readings for other people in any way or another. If you're an oracle or a diviner, this section at the beginning of this book is will answer a lot of questions about is it fate, is it fortune, how do you deal with bias, um, all sorts of other things, and that's hidden as a little hidden gem at the start of this book. The other thing, the second thing, is that 
Lynn has an app for it called uh, the um, Astrological Oracle, which you can get very cheaply on your mobile phone. And you simply um, uh, press the button. Let me see if I can um, just find it. Um, it should be on my front screen, is it? Here it is on my front screen. You press the Oracle. And you get your answer, which is huh, um, people uh, Aquarius 12 people on the stairs graduated upwards, and the situation is about uh, evolutionary status. What a perfect um, symbol! Um, and so you can get all of the interpretation. You can also see how it relates to a money question, a love question. Um, and uh, so forth just by clicking on the little buttons at the bottom and then you can journal it as well so that you can add your question and then record it and I kid you not this oracle um, the astrological oracle is one of the most laugh out loud oracles that you will ever have I have laughed out loud at the answer um, both through the symbols, the archaic symbolism, and the interpretation as being so bloody direct on more occasions than I can possibly count. So, um, unfortunately, it isn't available on Android, and, um, um, you know, it's, um, it's unlikely to be in the near future. Uh, Lynn's got a lot of projects on at the go at the moment, and um, unfortunately returning to that is more complex um, because it takes a long time to set up an app and then to keep it maintained every time Apple or Android do an upgrade is um, you know, more time consuming and costly than it's often worth unless you have a very best selling app of course. So I would highly recommend that you get it um, because it will put oh, ooh, all of this at your fingertips in a very succinct manner in a way that I use um, sometimes I've used it like every day for a couple of weeks while I've been navigating my way through a particular um, set of straits so highly recommended um, do get the book if you want a manual reference a big reference to it and um, also particularly for that first section which I do believe yep yeah, it's also in this book as well how to consult an oracle, how to get your bearings and direction and everything else that is useful to every diviner and oracle. Okay, so, um, so I hope I've talked a little bit to introduce the idea. We can come back to it. I'm sure we're going to have many days um, um, ahead of us and um, hopefully that's of interest and use to people. Um, I thought uh, we'd also take a um, uh, maybe every day we'll take a look at the uh, Lindemann cards and maybe a tarot card reading as well just to demonstrate some techniques but for today we'll just take a quick look at Lindemann again and um, then I'll move on to our bedtime story um, to end with um, unless people have questions in which case just put them in the um, column for me so um, what shall we talk about in the month? Oh, and I was going to say something about dreams, which was an additional thing to those who followed some of the dream symbolism interpretation yesterday, is to look at um, not just relationship, but also something called process. So when there's an object in a dream, not a person that we looked at yesterday with a person, an unknown person, and so on, um, and we looked at relationship, like what is the relationship between the elements of the dream. Another clue, uh, very important way of interpreting dreams is through function. So functional process. So if I look at a light and I have a light in my dream, then we think about the function of light, the function of light or the process of light. Well, it is to clarify something, to illuminate something. The process of, um, I had a strange dream last night actually involving a sewer and a very frightening, um, it, I think it was anxiety about um, disease or something like that, but it took place in a sewer 
and a sewer is obviously a place where waste is collected, it's a deep place, um, it's um, a place with um, 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 uh, a sort of, what's the word, a transitory process of clearing the sludge out and then recycling it goes. So that is the process, that is the part of my brain that is represented by a sewer, although one could say it was another part of one's brain that was represented by, by a sewer as well. But it is not a dream about sewerage or a sewer or underground pipes. It's what that place, what a person or what an object represents as its process, as its function. And so breaking a dream down into known person, unknown person, relationship and function of objects will get you the level of interpretation usually that your unconscious is providing you by those symbols. And then you can see the crossover to tarot, which we'll come back to. By looking at objects as functions, looking at people as processes and relationship symbols off, then we can interpret tarot cards in exactly the same way as well. Because as we discovered, uh, the Lindemann cards are also um, symbols from coffee ground readings, which come from dream readings, which from our earliest cave paintings um, in, in a more surprising way than uh, uh, people might realize. Um, as an oracle, as a set of symbols. So, um, oh, I'm glad, that, um, Christopher, that you're using the exercises in your group. Um, that that little way of approaching tarot um, opens up thousands of possibilities. Um, if you read Tarosophy, uh, my first book, or um, any of the later books, you'll see a lot of variations that draw from just that one simple premise. For example, if you want to do a reading or want to understand, for example, um, loyalty as an example, then um, you can look up the Hebrew word for loyalty, find the major arcana that spell that word out, and that will tell you the whole process of what loyalty is about, and also provide a template for a reading on top of it as well. So you can go it is astounding. You can go um, in lots of permutations from just that one simple idea. So here we have some Lenormand cards. So we take the cloud. Um, I'll, I'll just um, I'll, I'll take some more random ones. Um, where did I put the cards? Okay. So let's take a, actually let's take a look at these two. These are fairly random. The cloud. So its function and its symbology at the time that this deck was created was in connection actually with the star. The star, when this deck was created as a game, would be used for, we can give you a clue, this card, for navigation. So at the time this deck was produced, there's no such thing as um, um, tourism, not really, not in that sense, um, certainly not cruise ships. So this card, let me put it there, can we get that without flash, there we go. Um, this card was often about risk and venture, um, putting your money into a ship to go to a far off place. It might not come back, but it might come back and make you rich with trade. So this is about risky adventures, risky ventures usually to do with money, not necessarily about travel or going on holiday. So that card stays true to that. Similarly, the star card, unlike the star card in tarot, would be used for navigation, for navigation. So these two cards together would be very good. For example, that would show that you have um, a risky venture, a risky venture, but it is set on the right path because it can see the star. That way round, it might be that um, you have um, an idea of somewhere to go and you're about to set sail, but it's still risky. So that one 
if you read um, this card last is better than, than that way, depending on which way around you read them. And that's why it's important to have that set in your mind before you lay the cards out. But then if you have this card, the clouds, then obviously those two cards there are then almost annulled because the ship, which is a risky venture to begin with, has to set its sight by the star, but then the clouds are going to obscure that process. So if the clouds is at the end of that line, then basically there's a lot of confusion um, that needs to be clarified before you actually can see where you're going and set sail. Whereas if you had the cards the other way around, it would be a case of there is confusion, but then you set your sights clearly and then you set sail. So depending on which way round, which order, um, linearly, like so, um, you're reading the cards depends very much on the story that they're potentially telling. Okay, and we'll keep coming back to Le Monde in bits and pieces until we can perhaps build up um, a grand tableau. I won't be able to hold up a grand tableau, but I will be able to um, talk about it. Okay, so um, I think Charlotte, Charlotte's just joined us in order to um, get the bedtime story. So I'm going to put my glasses on for the bedtime story. And if you recall, we are reading, for those who are new here, um, from The Wake World by Alistair Crowley, which, as we get into it, has tarot symbolism written to the sides of it. Um, in an ascent narrative, a spiritual ascent narrative of the Tree of Life that explains how we get back to the divine um, or the divine connection or whatever you might want to call it yourself. So um, we've got about four or five minutes left, so I'm just going to read us a bedtime story if you're sitting comfortably. Uh, we'd heard that um, this is a story told by Lola Daydream. And Lola Daydream um, is waiting for her fairy prince, who has given her a magic ring um, by which she can call upon the fairy prince in order to be taken um, out of her daydream world, out of her dream world. And um, um, we got to the point of the incantation. So... Um, um, just one interesting point from yesterday in terms of interpretation, where she said, so I made up a pretty poem, which we're going to read in a second, to say every time I woke up, for you see, I am a very sleepy girl and dream ever so much about the other children. And that is a pity because there is only one thing I love. It's an allusion to the fact that often in life we spend our time thinking about other people and what they may be thinking and what they may be doing and what we would do if we were them or what we could do if we were them and not about ourself and our relationship to the divine which is represented by Lola and the fairy prince and um, I'm reminded um, from Crowley of a quote um, uh, um, by one of the Christian mystics who said um, spiritual experience is the opposite of everyday experience because everyday experience we want it all the time we want the next new thing and when we have it we don't really want it we stop wanting it whereas spiritual experience we never want it any of the time usually but when we do have it we say that we're never going to have anything else than this and we we want it um, to continue and so Mundane experience and spiritual experience are quite often often identifiable in that way. If it's something you want, it's unlikely to be spiritual experience. But if it's something that when you have it, you'd never want to let go of, then it's highly likely to be more spiritual. So here is the invocation of the ring um, in the little poem in the book um, written by Lola Daydream. And um, she also says you must pick out what the pictures mean and then it all makes poetry. And of course we know that the pictures 
are going to be the uh, major arcana of the tarot. So, so it starts off with the word Adonai, which we've already seen in session two, can be interpreted already in terms of tarot in um, an astounding um, impact, as um, Christopher has said. So, um, and I'll try and read the symbols as words, but I may just skip them because in some cases they are just symbols or Greek letters. Adonai, this is the invocation of the ring. Adonai, thou inmost alpha, self-glittering image of my soul, strong lover to my bride's desire, call me and claim me and control, I pray thee keep the holy tryst within this ring of amethyst. For on mine eyes the golden sun hath dawned, my vigil slew the night. I saw the image of the one, I came from darkness into LVX, which is the Latin for light. I pray thee keep the holy tryst within this ring of amethyst. Inri, me crucified, me slain, interned, arisen, inspire, tarot, me glorified, anointed, filled with frenzied alpha. I pray thee keep the holy tryst within this ring of amethyst. I eat my flesh, I drink my blood, I gird my loins, I journey far, for thou hast shown alpha omega. Sadai 777 Thelema, I pray thee keep this holy tryst within this ring of amethyst. Prostrate I wait upon thy will, mine angel, for this grace of union. O oh, let this sacrament distill thy conversation and communion. I pray thee keep the holy tryst within the ring of amethyst. She goes on to say, I have not told you anything about myself because it doesn't really matter. The only thing I want to tell you is about my fairy prince. But as I am telling you all this, I am 17 years old and very fair when you shut your eyes to look. But when you open them, I am really dark with a fair skin. I have ever such heaps of hair and big, big round eyes, always wondering at everything. Never mind, it's only a nuisance. I shall tell you what happened one day when I said the poem to the ring. I wasn't really quite awake when I began, but as I said it, it got brighter and brighter. And when I came to Ring of Amethyst the fifth time, there are five verses because my lover's name has five V's in it. He galloped across the beautiful green sunset, spurring the winged horse, till the blood made all the sky turn rosy red. So he caught me up and set me on his horse, and I clung to his neck as we galloped into the night. Then he told me he would take me to his palace and show me everything. And one day, when we were married, I should be mistress of it all. Then I wanted to be married to him at once, and then I saw it couldn't be, because I was so sleepy and had such bad dreams. And one can't be a good wife if one is always doing that sort of thing. But he said I would be older one day and not sleep so much. And everyone slept a little. But the great thing was not to be lazy and contented with the dreams. So I mean to fight hard. And that's where we'll leave Lola, having been taken away on the horse um, and promised to be shown the palace. And we are reminded again of um, Crowley's biblical uh, background in that um, my father's house has many mansions. And we are going to look at Lola's ascent with the prince through those mansions. But there's an indication in that poem as well that the fairy prince is Lola's holy guardian angel because she talks about communication and communion. So there's a connection between her as the virgin of the spirit, our apparent world that we see around us all of the time, and 
the marriage, which is the divine world being connected and married to the uh, everyday world that we see around us. And when those are simultaneous in our experience, then to some extent we are in the center of the tree having those two uh, experiences simultaneously. And that's why we have the high priestess at the top of the tree and the world at the bottom because it shows the anima mundi, the spirit of the world, and the internal spirit being connected to their respective um, points of contact with reality. And so we um, sit, and we can see how Lola does it, because she says she's very sleepy, and she can't be a good wife, i.e. married, that marriage can't happen while we're asleep. So we have to somehow wake up through this trip through the tarot cards in order to get to our spiritual um, home. So um, so what have we covered? We've gone everywhere from paintbrushes and bicarbonate soda, very alchemical, all the way to Lola um, and the palaces of the fairy prince. Um, via a few um, um, Lenormand cards and the personal story about how I got into tarot. I think what's more important is if you think about when you got into tarot, what expectations and what environment did that set? See, I got into tarot at school and then I became a teacher of tarot because to me tarot was always about learning and teaching because that's the environment in which I first contacted it. It's a little bit like it set a, a context for it for me. Um, my first date was copied out of a library, another place of learning. So um, um, I always had those associations with it. For each person, it's going to be individual. For each person, the tarot is your own personal tool to make that connection from here to there, from here to the light, that way, um, point there, there we go, can do that, and to that light, if I put my head there. There we go. I can, I can maybe get a halo there. So as we uh, make that connection, oh, that was clever. Um, um, then, um, sorry, that's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> then as we make that connection, um, we can make that through the tarot in our own personal way as well. So thank you for your time and attention and uh, indulging me. We are going to be doing this every night. Um, Trump said that this might last until July, August. So I think that's probably going to be um, about 170 of these at least. So we've got plenty of time to chat, come around the campfire, keep ourselves clean and hopefully um, keep ourselves sane and in good company and look after each other to some extent in whatever way we can. So um, be kind, be considerate, um, um, think about things as hard and fast as you can. As um, Lola said, um, I mean to work hard, um, I mean to fight hard. So um, let us all be like Lola and fight hard in whatever way we can um, in the coming times. So uh, thanks a lot everyone and uh, your comments and um, please ask questions so that I can be a bit more interactive um, each time otherwise my throat will eventually give out even though I still have my um, orange carrot and um, ginger um, elixir um, here uh, with me. So thanks for your time and attention. Tomorrow we're going to look at Charles Williams and um, I'm going to read a little bit from Charles Williams, The Greater Trumps, um, if you want to look up anything in advance. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye for now.